appears to be functioning this time. I'm also joined by Adam and Andy, who can take credit for this minor miracle. Adam will cover asset class returns, the history of bull and bear markets, and the phenomenon that took place last year where the mega cap, top handful of mega cap companies um, have completely dominated the S&P 500 and there's a big performance dispersion that's related to it. Andy will cover our size and style uh, positioning, uh, valuation uh, uh, indications between uh, value and growth companies, and then some examples of the diversifying benefits of the alternatives that we use. Um, I'm gonna touch on inflation before turning it over. Uh, despite the extraordinary stimulus uh, in 2019 and 2020, the Fed's 2% target uh, could not be hit. Uh, inflation ran below that. Last year, inflation exploded. 7% uh, was the year end number. Energy, commodities, uh, new and used vehicles, food, uh, a number of uh, major items uh, led that list of, of uh, creating the, the inflationary pressures. Uh, labor markets also contributed. The unemployment rate is down to 3.9%. That's an indication of a very tight uh, labor market, especially among low skilled workers. The labor participation rate, however, is also low. It's 81.9% at the end of the year. That compares to 83% before COVID. 84% has been the rate for much of the past several decades. Uh, what this means is that there's a large pool of workers who aren't seeking work right now. They're eventually, their eventual return will lessen the labor market pressures that we're experiencing right now. Despite all this, the 10-year treasury remains below 2%. This indicates that while inflation is indeed more than transitory, the Fed is expected to contain it. Adam. Thanks, Will. So we'll uh, quickly take a snapshot of what happened for the quarter and uh, also looking back on the entire year before talking about some more forward-looking topics uh, you know, that we're thinking about for 2022 and beyond. So. If you look at the quarter, it was definitely a bounce back quarter for what we saw in Q3, where markets were relatively flat and even slightly negative in some places. So if you look at specifically, you know, the, the domestic U.S. stock market, you almost notched what would be usually considered a solid single year return just in the quarter of just about 9% for domestic equities. International markets had a solid, you know, 3% in the developed markets in terms of positive returns. Uh, if you look at uh, REITs, you know, reflective broadly of the real estate market, uh, mostly commercial real estate with some residential multifamily sprinkled in there, uh, was the top performing asset class uh, for the quarter, up just over 12%. You know, another, uh, you know, another bounce back uh, in that regard. And emerging markets really the only laggard, you know, slightly negative on the quarter as it's trying to. Uh, in the uh, fundamental economies, they're trying to crawl out from from a rough uh, a rough patch as it relates to COVID, and just trying to get their economies back up and running. And a fairly flat bond market uh, for Q4. So, with that in mind, we'll just take a quick step back and look uh, a little further back in time, specifically over the prior year you know, through 2021. As most of us know by now, another really strong year for the domestic equity markets up. Uh, you know, if you look at, you know, the combined subcategories up just over 25%, international developed markets, a solid 12% return uh, with emerging markets and bonds, really the only uh, major sub-asset classes negative on the year. So, uh, you know, a lot of what we talked about over the last few webinars, even in the last year and the year before, was the long-term dispersion between the return here domestically and in other parts of the world. So as we start to look forward and think about things like asset allocation, positioning portfolios, and how to manage this current tension of uh, you know, changing uh, economic landscape coupled with relatively high valuations, you know, how do you manage that and, uh, and balance around it in terms of the way that your portfolio is allocated? So I think Andy's going to do a great job touching on that in a little more detail. Um, but just to kind of talk through where we are, uh, you know, economically, uh, you know, obviously what happened with COVID-19 over the last couple of years and the policies that came with it, 
uh, it changed both the the economic and the market landscape in a in a really substantial way. So most people now are stuck with uh, portfolios that have grown substantially, but also maybe out of balance. So the key, if anything, in terms of this specific presentation that we want to really highlight is now is the perfect time to reassess how your position and how the the growing domestic markets how how they might have thrown your portfolio out of balance and what types of things that we want to be thinking about. So uh, with that in mind, we're coming into this year with the expectation that, uh, you know, while 2021 specifically was fantastic, when you look at things like earnings growth and, um, you know, just a, a gradual reopening of the economy, the expectation going forward is that interest rates would continue to go up. Inflation would normalize at a level closer to historical averages. Uh, but that also earnings growth would, would would slow down. So when you think of those being some of the major drivers of the economy and where we're looking on a forward-going basis, the expectation is certainly for, for a, uh, a lower returning environment. So that being really the main key driver of, of now being the time to really look under the hood and reassess your allocation and, and the various risk, risk factors you're exposed to. Uh, when it comes to the government, you know, last year we came into the year expecting some potential significant changes, giving a new administration was taking office. One of the big things that was talked about throughout the year with chatter picking up through the summer and the end of the year was the potential for major a major spending plan to be passed that included some tax increases. And uh, very quietly, quietly, I think it went from being, you know, a very high likelihood uh, that that was potentially going to happen to not happening at all, you know, when we hit the end of uh, 2021 in December. So that was really the big story in terms of, of what happened uh, in, in Congress and in Washington. And now what's, what's happening behind the scenes is they're trying to pick up the pieces and determine what can be done for this year in light of midterm elections kicking in, uh, you know, this November. So it'll be interesting to see if the conversation specifically around tax increases gets brought back up and uh, if there's any development on that front. But I think it's fair to say with the economy starting to reopen and uh, in, a, in a more forward-looking uh, sense of optimism, it's, it's likely that a lot of the fiscal stimulus that we've been relying on the last several years is, is uh, ending, if not significantly, slowing down. Uh, so that's the... Uh, you know, certainly the big the big piece out of what's happening in Washington and the Federal Reserve is going to be getting a ton of attention this week and definitely through the year as we're planning for now what's expected to be four interest rate increases starting this spring and into the end of the year. So uh, one of the things when you think about uh, you know monetary policy and what the Fed does is over the last 15 years the amount of transparency, that we have from the Fed has gone up significantly, and things are very, very well telegraphed. So uh, we, we saw a little bit of a little bit of that last year. We see that with their continued communication. But you know, the big um, magnifying lens right now on right now is not on necessarily how many interest rate increases are going to happen this year, but what's the magnitude of those going to be, and um, and you know, how would that differ from market expectations? So a lot of what we're seeing to start the year is revolving around this guessing game of, are they going to have to raise rates more significantly sooner? And, uh, you know, how do we price that in when it comes to looking at the uh, the market? So with this, back, with this backdrop of this tension, again, between, you know, fundamentals and market valuation, um, we're, we're um, you know, really – taking a deep dive and looking into portfolios and seeing what makes sense in terms of allocation changes to better, better self, set ourselves up on a, on a forward going basis. Uh, and Andy, the next thing I wanted to share here was really related to um, if we could slide through just one more, um, a couple of points of historical reference uh, before I pass it off to Andy. And I think this captured two of the main uh, you know, questions that we're getting uh, across our client base. The first has been around uh, that question of, you know, hey, we're coming out of another really strong year for the stock market. What does that mean uh, historically? And, you know, should I be concerned or should we be worried about, you know, the market in general and, and the length of the bull market? So um, I, 
caught wind of this and thought it would be helpful to share because it really puts things in a, in a good snapshot and, and a lot of historical perspective. But this is looking at uh, the S&P 500 over almost the last 60 years and highlighting both the bull market cycles and the bear market cycles in some aggregated data as it relates to them. So the blue bars here represent the bull markets, and you can see above them the length of time in terms of months and then the percentage returns. And on the bottom, we've got the, uh, the bear markets indicated in red and also their percentage decline and the length of that decline. So the average duration for a bull market over this you know, backward-looking period is roughly 70 months with a bear market average of about 15 months. You can see some took a little bit longer and some were a little more, uh, you know, a little greater in terms of their magnitude, uh, in terms of their total return. Uh, but, you know, what we're looking at here is a bull market that really technically would have started after the COVID sell-off in 2020. So uh, if you compare that to past bull markets and understanding that not two, not any two bull markets or bear markets are the same, they're all driven by different, fa different factors and different reasons. Uh, but what we're really focusing now on is not necessarily on how much longer is this particular bull market going to run, but um, as uh, I'll show on the next slide here, really, it's what's been the makeup of the most recent run-up in stock, and how can we apply that to how we view portfolios and the changes that we make? So one really uh, significant observation about this recent bull run that we've been participating in is the level of concentration uh, you know, within the returns of the market. So I'll try to explain that a little bit better in, in saying that you know, if you look at the, at the broad index that we mostly use to track the U.S. stock market being the S&P 500, if it increases by a certain amount, you know, what's the makeup of that increase? You know, which, which companies contributed to that and which were detractors from that return? And something that is always, always mindful to uh, keep an eye on is, if you look at the makeup of the index, uh, how concentrated it in terms in terms of are there a few, a few or fewer number of companies making up most of that return and making up most of the index composition, and we certainly are seeing that now in terms of um, how the top five stocks in the index represent the index as a whole. So what you've noticed here on the left, going back to the early 90s, all the way through the end of uh, last year is that the top five stocks within the S&P represent almost a quarter of its weighting. So, you know, if you've got five out of a little over 500 companies making up about 25% of that index, so they have an overwhelming amount of power and influence in terms of its ups and downs. And if you compare that to what we saw through even 2000 in the tech bubble um, and also through the early 90s, it's uh, you know, significantly well above what we've seen in terms of averages, and not only in concentration, but also returns. So if you look on the right of this, we're looking at the performance uh, of these top five stocks in the dark blue shaded line, and we're comparing that to the performance of the next top five and then the rest of the index or the, the index as a whole behind it. So if you look at the performance dispersion between these top five stocks and just the index, across the board, it's almost, uh, you know, double in terms of the return. And that's something uh, that's, in, you know, is incredibly important to be mindful of as you're looking at, uh, you know, some of these indices and what the sources of return has been. So Andy, I think, is going to do a really good job of pulling back uh, some additional layers of that and, and, uh, and discussing and applying how we're going to be implementing that or how we view that in terms of our uh, portfolio. So certainly something to look at on a forward going basis. And I think Andy, that's probably a good segue uh, to pass it off to you. Yeah, no, it is. That, that's just a crazy amount of concentration in a very short period of time. I might add that, you know, I, th I think it's the case that all five of those, the, the biggest stocks um, are large growth companies. So I think that's actually a great segue into my section here next. Um, and, and what I want to do is, is just give a quick update on our strategy and how we're positioning. But before I jump into that, let me just take a step back and refresh everyone what we aim to do. So in uh, the academic literature and finance, there are a size premium and a style premium that exist. And said another way, what that means is small cap stocks are expected to outperform large cap stocks and value stocks are expected to outperform growth stocks in the long term. But the problem is that's not a stable relationship. Um, and you know, 
it's often the case that the segment that uh, should have the premium doesn't always outperform. I think that large growth outperforming everything else uh, is probably going to sound pretty familiar to most. Uh, but I will say, so with what we do in our strategies, we do tilt into the size and style phase that we expect to outperform moving ahead. But with that said, I think given the academic literature, we are always more comfortable, especially tilting in towards value. And what I want to point out here is the recent size and style performance over the past few years. If we can think back before the pandemic and the before times, it seemed like value was actually poised to have its time in the, to shine. And in 2019, we actually saw across all market caps, value stocks began outperforming growth stocks and the momentum was leaning that way. Well, enter the pandemic and it just so happened that the stocks that were the work from home stocks basically all tended to be in the growth category. So what we saw was growth companies do extraordinarily well in 2020 and value really just struggled to tread water. But if we fast forward again to last year, um, value momentum returned. And that's especially the case in the small and mid cap uh, market caps. Now, it, it looks like the pandemic might have just delayed our expected value phase back from 2019 by a year, uh, now that we're beginning to see some of that momentum come through. But I think it's a natural question to ask, you know, how much room is there for value? And the answer is quite a lot. If you look at the relative cheapness of value, it really looks like an historical outlier, similar to or even more extreme than what we saw during the late 90s in the tech boom. Now, it is the case that growth stocks should be more expensive than value stocks because there are higher growth expectations, but the amount of that expectation has been stretched beyond three standard deviations of normal across the globe. And really, since 2018, what we've seen is it's not fundamentals that are really driving the performance of growth stocks. Rather, it's price multiple expansion, uh, which, you know, as we learned in the 90s, price multiples can only expand so far. So we keep saying that the 2020s resemble or are likely to resemble the 2000s. And, you know, if you can think back, the 2000s are known as the lost decade in stocks because the S&P 500 was flat for the whole decade. But that really doesn't tell the whole story. Really, it was a decade where growth was coming off an incredible run of price multiple expansion and then really struggled over the next decade as it lost its battle with regression to the mean. Now, value, on the other hand, over this lost decade actually did produce positive returns. So you might have heard the saying that history doesn't repeat, but it often rhymes. And there do seem to be a lot of similarities between then and now. So that leads me to the question, you know, what's going on so far in 2022? And what we've seen, as you may, if you follow the, the markets at all, you may have seen that stocks have had a bit of a rough start to January. Um, but really what's going on is growth is struggling. It's even approaching correction territory while value is actually holding up just fine. And, and whether you're invested in our size and style responsive strategy or our master strategy, your portfolio right now is leaned into these value stocks. And we expect to hold that positioning for the foreseeable future. So I, that, that basically ends what I wanted to cover with our specific strategies. I did want to close out the webinar by saying, uh, by moving on to the topic of alternative investments, because I really think the last two years have been an excellent case study into why alternatives add value to a portfolio. But first, let me ask this question. Why use alternatives in the first place? Uh, the first thing that might come to mind is that there might be higher return expectations. And while that may be part of the motivation, especially in certain asset classes within the alternative sphere, it really isn't the primary motivation. The primary motivation is that alternatives should provide a return stream that is not correlated with traditional asset classes like stocks and bonds. Diversification really only works if the securities that make up a portfolio don't move in the same direction at the same time. So ideally, when one asset class sells off, you have other assets in your portfolio that hold up to protect your portfolio, or, or even better yet, give you ammunition to buy low into the asset class that is selling off. So I think most asset allocation advice you might find out there doesn't incorporate alternatives into their mix, 
And, you know, that's oftentimes because advisors view alternatives as too complex to analyze or too, gif too difficult to gain access to. But we do include a few alternative asset investments into our wealth management asset allocation models because we do believe that they help to reduce risk in a portfolio and increase risk adjusted returns. So next with these, with the next uh, you know, final few slides here, we'll go ahead and show what low to no correlation means in practice using both 2020 and 2021 as case studies. So I think everyone on this call is painfully aware that there was a big market crash in 2020. And at the time, as we still do today, most of our asset allocation models actually called for using a type of investment called managed futures. So managed futures are trend following strategies typically offered in a mutual fund wrapper that have the flexibility to go both long and short traditional asset classes like stocks and bonds, but also other asset classes like commodities and currencies. And during the March of 2020 crash, we all know that stocks got crushed, but many people don't realize that bonds actually sold off too as investors were worried about the credit worthiness of their fixed income investments. And this increase in correlation is problematic because this is, this is exactly the time where you'd want your fixed income investments to hold their ground. But this is very similar to what we saw back in 2008 where both stocks and bonds, at least for a time, saw their correlations rise in the middle of a crisis. And its futures by contrast actually rose in value during this time frame. So when we talk about low to no correlation between asset classes, this is really what we mean. Managed futures shined during this crisis period in the market, holding up to the pressures both in the fixed income market and the equity markets. But you know, as we've learned, stocks aren't the only asset class that can sell off. We do think of bonds as being less risky um, you know, being the less risky component of a portfolio, but 2021 showed that it is possible for bonds too to produce negative returns. Bond prices are inversely correlated with interest rates. So when interest rates rise, the prices of bonds fall and can hamper performance. And 2021 is a great case study on this phenomenon. Because as you can see, especially early in the year when expectations were that interest rates were going to begin rising, you know, bonds really did sell off. Now, managed futures historically show no correlation to both equity markets and fixed income markets. And again, similar to how they held up back in 2020 during the stock market crash, they did their job and held ground in the face of bonds falling in value as well. But another alternative investment that I wanted to highlight today are private credit investments. So private credit is similar to public fixed income. Uh, but the difference really is that it's lending offered to private companies versus public companies. And return expectations are higher in the private credit space uh, because there is a premium demanded by investors due to the illiquidity that private markets typically carry, but also because private credit funds have the opportunity to be opportunistic. So in 2021, this was a great case study where you know, private credit was an awesome complement to public fixed income, because while public fixed income was falling in value, private credit actually increased uh, throughout the course of the year. And I, I wouldn't say that private credit is a one-to-one -one replacement uh, to be used with high quality bonds. High quality bonds still have their place. Private credit is going to be riskier than, than most of the bond funds out there. But when used in conjunction with one another, private credit can pick up the slack in the bond market as it did last year. So. All in all, I wanted to show these two years because alternative investments did their job of holding their ground, both when stocks sold off in 2020 and when bonds sold off in 2021. So this is really what we mean when we talk about low to no correlation. And I hope these case studies help make that concept a little bit more concrete. Now, if you are a Bernie investment management client who wants to explore if an allocation to other diversifying assets might fit into your portfolio, please reach out to your advisor to see if our Bernie Wealth Management Services might be appropriate for you. So that ends the prepared remarks that we had today, um, but we did wanna leave some time for your questions. I know I saw a few come over, so we'll go to the next slide. 
Um, so let me just go ahead and grab that first question, Adam, as to whether or not there's a desktop version of our mobile app. So I know this was a question that came up in our webinar last week as well, but we didn't have a Q&A session really to answer it. So this is a great time to do so. Um, and to answer the question, there is both a desktop version of our app and a smartphone version. So you can go either to the uh, Apple Store or the Google Play Store to download the Bernie One app to have it directly on your phone, or you can go to BernieWealth.com and go to the client login section to gain access to the app. The login is the same for both the app and the desktop version. Great, Nandy. I'm going to grab this question here. I think it's a really good one uh, because I've gotten it myself from a few clients around, you know, if you look at the, you know, the makeup of an index to the top five or even top 10 companies, do they, do they change or, you know, are they static through time? And, and the answer is uh, maybe you have some additional insight on top of this. They absolutely change. Um, and that's, that's a, um, a really key piece related to how in indexes are constructed and also how the markets change over time. And there's probably some interesting visuals we can share either on the next webinar or send out um, as a one-off and maybe a blog post or something. But, you know, if you go back and look at the 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000s, you see almost full turnover a lot of, of a lot of those top 10 companies from decade to decade. And, um, you know, for a number of reasons that happens, uh, but uh, it happens nonetheless, and it's absolutely something that needs to be monitored over time. So there are some companies that, you know, we're in the top 10 in the 90s that don't even exist today, or now they're much smaller for a number of reasons. But that's part of the uh, the risk factors of index investing and not having a, a full sense of control over uh, over how you allocate across individual companies. Yeah, and Adam, I read a really interesting blog post, I think earlier this week or last week, that showed the performance of the top five uh, stocks per market cap and what they did leading up to that. So like, I think it was like the three years leading up to that and then what they did in the three to five years afterwards. And, and the problem is, you know, these, these companies get to be the largest companies in the world because they see extraordinary growth. But then once they achieve that size, it's really, really difficult to keep that up. You know, some, some companies are unicorns and they can do it. You know, Apple's been a great case study here recently on that. Um, but if you look back historically, typically these largest companies do end up producing disappointing returns on a forward going basis once they be, once they enter that top five group. Yeah, without a doubt. Maybe that's something we can share some more information on next time uh, to put some you know, detailed context behind it. We have another question, Andy, and maybe you want to grab this one, but it's around just the idea, and it made a lot of headlines, you know, that we went through and have gone through a meaningful period of time without a quote-unquote correction in the market. So how should we be thinking of that as investors and, uh, you know, you know what, what do we need to do? Essentially, it's the question. Yeah, it's a great question. So you should expect a market correction about as frequently as you have a birthday. So when we look back historically, on average, there's one correction. I'll define that as a 10% decline from peak to trough in the stock market a year. So I think that that just has to be an expectation that, that is front of mind. And the only way to achieve the return premium offered by stocks is to be invested through it all, because you never know when it's going to come. Oftentimes, these corrections can come clustered together, and there can be long periods of time where there is you know, no stock market correction at all. That's kind of what we're going through here here recently, um, you know, so the, the fact that we haven't had a correction doesn't necessarily doesn't necessarily mean that there is a disaster that's imminent around the corner. But to your point from earlier in the presentation, Adam, you know, now that we are in a position of strength, it is a good time to consider rebalancing. And if you do have an asset allocation that's been pre-specified, it's a great time to check to see if it's still in line with what your expectations are. And, and it may make sense to rebalance back towards uh, the portfolio that is most appropriate for you. Yeah, absolutely. And something else I saw just as a side note is, uh, and this goes under this whole concept of looking under the hood, you know, the indexes will tell you one story, but maybe something else is happening underneath. And, uh, I think it was over, over well over 90% of the companies in, in the S&P 500, in the Russell, and also in the NASDAQ experienced 10% uh, plus sell-off at some point during the last year. So 
uh, while it's not reflected in what's happened in the index, a, ma a majority, an overwhelming majority of the companies in, within all of the major indices have experienced what you would define as a correction. And the average show up, I think, was somewhere in the neighborhood of almost 20 percent. So I think it was more of a timing element of when, you know, when these sell-offs were occurring versus other stocks, you know, holding up the index in general. But that's something that doesn't get reflected. It's, you know, what happens at the individual company level. And we've had, you know, a lot of volatility despite what the indexes are, are telling us. Yeah, sometimes those top five names can cover up for what's going on beneath it. I do know that a lot of the pandemic darlings have pulled back quite a bit, you know, so there has been some churn under underneath that headline number. Yep. Yeah, no question. So um, I don't see any other uh, actually you know, Adam, I, questions here coming through. I have one more know. that came through the Zoom chat. Yeah, Andy, I, I, okay, I, great. let me read that and then I can um, address that one. Sure. Um, the, the comment was, since the late 80s, data shows a portfolio of alts, equities, and fixed income has greater annualized returns and less volatility. Um, some believe the new 6040 includes alts. Uh, how uh, does this information impact our, our core strategy? Um, I think anybody that's gone through our, our asset allocation process has seen that basically our new 6040 would be something closer to 60 2020, where um, half of what would ordinarily be a fixed income allocation has become uh, an, an alternative allocation. And there's a variety of, of alternatives. And in addition to the two that the two primary ones that we use are the two that, that Andy described, but there are other alternatives out there. Um, that are also candidates. And I think especially given the, the poor return prospects for fixed income, it's essential that we have some uh, significant response um, to that. And, and alternatives are the, the sort of the promised area for achieving the diversification benefits that we seek, but also not uh, uh, in, involving the return sacrifice that fixed income would. Yeah, yeah, I think in summary we agree, right? That the uh, the, the the straight answer would be yes, and the the reason it being, you know, especially those that are either heavy on just plain domestic equities in the context of their whole portfolio, very large cap heavy, or those with just plain vanilla stock to bond allocations. This is this is about reassessing. So now it's the perfect time to do that, and um, you know we're happy to have that conversation. But you know these are. These are the windows that are provided to make that assessment and see what makes sense and better position yourself, not based on what's happening, but based on the prospects for what's ahead. So, uh, Andy, do we, have, do we have any other questions? I know we're just a tad over uh, a half hour here. Lowell, do you have something else? Yeah. So, Adam, yeah, there was one follow-up question regarding real estate as a diversifying um, option. That's definitely uh, a, a diversifying asset class that uh, we would encourage use of, both private and public real estate. Yeah, and that's something we've looked at. I mean, clients come to the question all the time. If they just own properties outright, obviously take on management responsibility. There's additional costs. It's very geographically specific. But uh, even outside of publicly traded real estate, which if you look at a ETF um, or just publicly traded REITs, they do tend to behave in the short run very much like just the general stock market. So something we've looked at is you know diversifying a step away from that as part of the alternative allocation. So there's absolutely a benefit to that in a number of different directions. Yeah, you know, it's part of that just overall conversation about what should my asset allocation look like. Sandy, do you have any, anything else coming coming through? Obviously, uh, we'll make a recording available to everybody.